The Princess of the Chalet School, Chapter Seven. The Middles are revenged. For a full week after that, the membership of the SSM rather languished. There were so few rules in the school that, as a rule, punishments were not often needed. The one about the use of slang had been absolutely necessary, since it was not to be expected that the mothers of the girls who were not English would be pleased if their daughters picked up vocabularies of English slang. The others were based on the same principle. It was an English school, so school had to be spoken during the school hours, except during lessons in other languages. The girls were not supposed to speak at all after lights out, and the little ones were forbidden to play by the lakeside or on the banks of the little stream which flowed through the valley without special permission. These were the bulk of the regulations, and the slang one was the one most frequently broken. Matron tried to enforce a few of her own. They mainly related to tidiness, mending, and so on. But one she did make, and which proved very unpopular, had to do with the Sunday morning reading. On Sundays, the rising bell did not ring until half past eight. Several of the girls woke up at their usual hour, seven o'clock, and the head had already given permission for them to have books by their beds. On this one morning in the week, so that they might read if they wanted to pass the time that way, Matron now put a stop to this. On the second Sunday night, she confiscated all the books she found in the dormitories, and when the girls protested that they had always done it, she snapped out, "Then it ceases from this term. If you wake up, you may lie awake and rest yourselves. There's going to be no more reading in bed." So don't let me catch any of you with books in your cubicles after this. Funnily enough, the school took it for granted that Miss Bettany had decided this, and they knew better than to make a complaint if that was the case. No one afterwards could explain how this had been decided. The fact remained that the girls grumbled among themselves, but otherwise took it quietly. Joe was the one most affected. She had a trick of waking very early, and as it was always, lay awake for an hour or more since the headmistress had forbidden reading before seven o'clock, laying awake, tossing restlessly from side to side for a couple of hours or more, was not rest, and she always woke up on Sundays tired out to begin with. This went on for three Sundays without the head noticing it, and then one Sunday it struck her. That her little sister was looking very shadowy about the eyes, and she made inquiries as to the reason for it. Why are you looking so tired, Joey? She asked during the afternoon, when she always had Joey with her for an hour or two. Your eyes are like saucers, and you're as white as a sheet. Haven't you been sleeping? Yes, but I do so hate laying awake. Till the rising of the bell, with nothing to do," explained Joey. "Nothing to do!" exclaimed Madge. "Then what has become of all your books? Don't tell me that you have read everything in the library yet, because I shan't believe it." "Of course I haven't," said Joe indignantly. "But that's a lot of use to me when you've put an end to reading on Sunday mornings. When I've what?" gasped. Madge, sitting bolt upright, didn't you? Demanded Joey. Put an end to Sunday morning reading? No, I certainly have not. I'm afraid I must have said something to lead Matron to think that I wished it to be stopped," said Madge, who knew very well she had done nothing of the sort, as the question had never arisen. I will tell Matron that I never meant anything of the kind. She changed the subject after that. And they said no more about it. But Joey took care to explain to the others the order had been originated by Matron, and that the headmistress had had nothing to do with it. The indignation in school was great. The SSM called a meeting as soon as possible and decided that this last offense must not go unpunished. Had they but known it, Miss Bettany had given Matron a bad half hour in the study already. For she was seriously annoyed at the whole affair. 
Margia summoned a meeting under the pines and invited certain people with the middles to join them. Joey, Elisavita, Frida, Simone, and Bianca accepted, and the rowdy gathering met and vowed that matron should be taught the proper way of treating the head of the school. All those who agree that we should try to get matron to shove off, hands up, cried Evandine excitedly. Every hand went up. Good, said Margia. Now be quiet for a few minutes and everyone think of something to do to her. They settled down to think. There was a little silence. Elisavita was the first to speak. I have thought, she said plaintively, how much longer do you others want? I've got an idea too, said Ilonka. Hurry up, you people. We've all had time to think, said Margia. Now don't all yell at once. Paula, you're the oldest. Carry on and tell us what your idea is. I think we ought to make a, how do you say it? A booby trap on her door, said Paula, who was not famed for originality and had gotten this idea from her library book. And have her asking who did it and dragging Madam into it again, said the president of the society contemptuously. Talk sense. Paula retired crushed and Sophia made her suggestion. Let's nail her window down. Margia sighed. I wish you'd all use your brains a little. I hope no one's going to be idiotic enough to suggest an apple pie bed. We must have something subtle. She'd know at once that some of us had done it. She's not stupid. After that scathing remark, nobody was anxious to make any suggestions. It was difficult, when you came to think of it, to fix on something which matron wouldn't at once lay to their account. Finally, Alessavita made a suggestion, which was the best so far. Let's tie something on a string and dangle it out of the blue dormitory window so that it keeps tapping against her window, she proposed. If we could do it during the night, it would have a weird sound. Not bad, agreed the president. What else she would have said remained blurred in oblivion, for at that moment Joey leapt to her feet with a shout of, Eureka, I've got it! What happened? cried the united SSM. For reply, Joey turned to Simone. Simone! Do you remember I told you about the time when Madame and the Robin and I went to stay with Marny in the New Forest? Simone nodded, for a face flashed with excitement. Ah, uh, yes. You said it was horrible, she cried eagerly, putting an extra number of R's into the last word and becoming extra French over the memory. What was it? demanded Margia. You never told us. It was gruesome, declared Joe, with a little shiver at the memory. It was at three o'clock in the morning, and I woke up to hear the most ghastly squealing sounds just outside my window. It had wakened the robin, too, and we were frozen with horror. It was so scary. We were so scared we couldn't speak. It sounded like, like a soul in torment. Luckily, the robin let out. And the most awful squeal, and my sister heard, and she was sleeping next door. She came dashing in under the impression that one of us was being killed, and then we discovered what it was. A snail had got on the glass somehow, and was creeping down. You know how they hump their bodies in the middle, and then spreading out to move on? Well, that was what was going on. And anything more uncanny, I never want to hear. And you think it would be a jolly good thing to do with Matron? I do too, said Margia eagerly. Let's go and catch snails. After our break, there are dozens in the garden. We can take one upstairs and stick it on the window, and she'll never know that it didn't get there on its own. But how will you put it on the window, asked Frida, who possessed most of the common sense in the society. It is too far up to reach from the ground, 
and too far below the window of the blue dormitory for Joey or Lisevita or Bianca to scratch down. Oh, we'll manage somehow, declared Jo, who was delighted with her own scheme. Trust me for that. After cafe that afternoon, the middles trotted off to the garden and had a snail hunt. They got six fat ones, which for the present were regulated to a box in Margia's drawer, and then they went off to the cricket practice with the air of archangels. At eleven o'clock that night, the window of the blue dormitory was cautiously pushed up to its farthest extent, and three faces looked out. For once, fortune had favored them. Eugene, the boy of all works, who had been touching up the fresco which adorned the walls there, he had left his ladder standing against the side of the house. It was an easy matter for three active schoolgirls to climb over the balcony and get on to the nearest rung. From that, it was a mere step to get to Matron's window, where Jo reconnoitered cautiously before she proceeded any further. Matron was laying asleep, snoring. Jo held out her hand and took the snail. Elisaveta handed to her with a little shudder. Then she put it on the window pane, holding it for a minute until it had a chance to stick to the glass. Now me, insisted Elisaveta. I want to do one. Joey amiably climbed further down the ladder, and the princess affixed her slimy pet to the glass. Then the three went softly back up the ladder, managed to climb back to the balcony without breaking their legs or arms in the process. Even if she thinks it's us, she won't be able to swear to it, said Joe with a low chuckle. What are you doing, Elisavita? Going to make sure she won't, replied Elisavita, as she pushed the ladder outwards. It fell with a soft thud onto the long grass, but luckily for them, it woke no one, though it did disturb Matron, who rolled over on her side, half opening her eyes as she did so. She was not fully roused, however, and the trio got back into bed before anything further happened. They were all nearly asleep when the chalet was suddenly awakened by a wild yelling. Another and another followed. There was a sound of opening windows and scurrying feet, and then Miss Bettany's voice was heard, demanding to know what was the matter. The wicked three tumbled out of bed once more and joined the agitated crowd on the stairs. They were rewarded by seeing Matron clad only in her night dress and with her hair in curling pins, rushing out on to the lower landing, crying that her room was haunted by murderers. Margia, who had emerged from the yellow dormitory just in time to hear this, caught Elisabetta's eye and went off into a fit of smothered laughter. In the meantime, Miss Bettany had boldly ventured into the room and at once realized what had happened. It's all right, matron, she said. It's only two snails who have been promenading down the window pane. There they are. She pointed them out. And the room was instantly crowded by people who wanted to see the disturbers of the peace. Joe and Elisavita were among them, and Joey had the presence of mind to exclaim, Oh, isn't that just exactly what happened to the robin and me in England? Do you remember, madam? It was horrid. Two of them, said Miss Maynard, innocently helping her out. That is one worse than you, Joey. One was bad enough, declared Joe. Two must be awful. Shall I knock them off onto the grass? It would be as well, agreed her sister. I wonder how they got up here. Who can fathom the ways of snails? laughed Miss Maynard. Nobody tried to answer her, and Miss Bettany sent the girls all back to bed the next minute, so they heard no more. Matron went back to her room, feeling annoyed with herself for having made such a fuss about such a little thing, and peace once more settled down on the chalet school. Chapter 8 The Feud Continues No one was blamed for the snail's curious choice of promenade. Joey's speech about the occurrence while they had been at the Maynards had completely thrown her sister off the scent, and though Matron had her suspicions, 
she could scarcely suggest the girls were to blame for it. Moreover, Miss Bettany had snubbed her so severely over the stopping of the Sunday morning reading that she felt that she had better lie low for a while. As for the SSM, they were so delighted with themselves that the wonder was that they did not give themselves away. It was a topping rag, announced Margia enthusiastically at their next meeting. If we can only push a few more like that on to her, we shall soon get rid of her. What can we do next? Better wait a while, said Joe practically. If things happen too often, she'll get suspicious. Not that that would be anything fresh for her, she added. I've thought of a lovely plan, cried Elisivita. It won't be at her exactly, but Madame will set it down to her. I doubt it, remarked Joe feelingly. She's all there, my sister. It'll have to be a jolly good thing to get her to blame her and not us for anything we do. She will this time, though, retorted the princess, who was sitting in a most unprincess-like attitude, with her feet on her desk. They were in their form room at the time. It's just this. Let's all begin to talk like matron. A grin of pure delight illuminated Joey's features at the idea. She knew her sister's idea on the subject of voices. Miss Bettany herself had a low musical voice, and if there was anything she disliked more than another in matron, it was the loud, harsh tones in which she invariably spoke. If the entire middle school began to copy them, Joe foresaw trouble of all kinds coming to them. All the same, it was a really beautiful chance. She contented herself by saying, well, I hope you're prepared to write out that things of Shakespeare's about her voice was ever soft, gentle, and low, an excellent thing in women. Umpteen times, for that's what will happen to us. We must begin gradually, said Elisavita, warming up as she went to explain the details of her plan. If we all start shouting at once, they will know it is on purpose. Joey nodded, thoughtfully. That's true. You really are a brain, Elisavita. We'd better begin. Just two or three of us, by degrees. The others can join in later. I reckon it's our turn to shine, said Evandine. You three did the snail stunt, so some of the rest of us ought to get busy with this first. Well, you and Suzanne and Ilanka and me, said Margia, then you others by degrees. I shall have to remember to shout." They were careful not to begin that day. It was too soon after what Evandine called the snail stunt. The next morning, Suzanne was called to order twice for speaking loudly, and Ilanka was warned that if she couldn't moderate her tones, she would be put into silence at mealtimes. In the afternoon, Mr. Denny, the school singing master, came to give them their bi-weekly lesson. He was a dreamy, irresponsible being who declared that all teaching should be based on Plato's. That is, the music should have the first place in every school. The girls had christened him Plato because he talked so much about the great philosopher and liked him very much. This afternoon, it seemed good to them to give him a taste of what was coming. They did not dare do much, for Mademoiselle was accompanying them. But at the end of the afternoon, when the master was saying goodbye to Miss Maynard, whom he chanced to meet in the passage, he said, in rather bewildered tones, What has chanced to make our little maid so noisy today? How do you mean? asked Miss Maynard quietly. They seem to have forgotten their soft voices and adopted a louder tone, which is hurtful to the ear, he explained. All of them? queried the mistress. Plato thought a minute. Nay, not all, but some spoke in strident tones, which I do not like. Perchance they are excited over some girlish trifle. Perhaps they are, agreed Miss Maynard, non-committally. He went off after that, and Miss Maynard, left to herself, put in some hard thinking. Miss Bettany had gone away for the weekend to interview her lawyers in Innsbruck about some business. 
she had gone that afternoon and would spend the Saturday with Frida Manche's family going to Maria's for the Sunday and returning early on Monday morning. Joey had known of this, and it had seemed to her to be a good opportunity for beginning the last campaign. At coffee, which the girls always had by themselves, Miss Maynard wandered in to the Spisal under some slight pretext. But there was nothing to worry her then. They were all talking in their usual manner. She decided that singing master must have had a bad attack of imagination and went her way, relieved and grateful. The next day was Saturday and guide parade. The Shelley School Company was not a large one, but they were all very keen. Work this term consisted of badge work and making furnishings for a big dollhouse which was destined for one of the children's hospitals in Vienna, and special drills. As Miss Bettany, the guide captain, was away, the girls spent most of their time on the doll's house. Miss Maynard, as the lieutenant, supervised all the work, and went from one to another giving advice and helping where it was necessary. She was dismayed to notice that in one or two of the girls there was a tendency to speak roughly, and Evandine was screeching away with Suzanne, Ivanka, and Margia. They stopped as soon as she spoke to them, but they soon forgot and went on again. Even Margia appeared to be losing her soft voice and talked at the full pitch of her lungs. The SSM exchanged glances of congratulations as they noted the mistress's face. The plan was working beautifully. All the same, I wish she'd go and hang round some of the others for a change, murmured Margia as she bent over her, her fret saw. My throat's hoarse with shrieking. Cave, Marnia's coming, muttered Joe. I say, I think I'll begin. And Miss Maynard was horrified to hear her say in her loud tones, Hand over the rest of this affair, Margia, will you? I can't get on. Joe, exclaimed the guide lieutenant. Why are you shouting like that? Was I shouting? said Joy innocently. I'm awfully sorry, Miss Maynard. But you are still shouting, protested Miss Maynard. You must not do it. You know how Madame dislikes it. Joey murmured, sorry, and went on with her work in silence. Miss Maynard went her way thoroughly perplexed. A possible solution of the mystery occurred to her when she interviewed Matron after a meal about some laundry that had gone missing. Could it have possibly been that the girls were catching it from her? There would be trouble if it went on, that was certain. Miss Maynard decided to take instant steps to check it. The first opportunity came during the evening when the girls were wandering about the garden. Margia was surrounded by her own particular set, amongst them Elisavita. To the horror of the mistress, the little princess was audible for the, from the other side of the tennis lawn. What her family would think if they could hear her, Miss Maynard was appalled to think. She fled over to the children. Elisavita, she exclaimed, you must not talk so loudly. I can hear you at the other end of the garden. Can you, Miss Maynard? said Elisavita, wide-eyed. I did not know. I'm sorry. It's dreadful, declared the mathematics mistress. If I hear you, or any of the other girls for that matter, talking so loudly, I shall give her lines for the future. Then she turned away, leaving the wicked band chuckling over the success of their scheme. They took little notice of the mistress's warning, and before the last middle was in bed that night, four of them were condemned to spend part of their free time on Monday in writing out Shakespeare's words twenty times in their best handwriting. Sunday was a little worse than Saturday. Some of the babies were beginning to pick it up, and Miss Durant, who had charge of them that day, was nearly at her wit's end. To know how to check it, to add to the difficulties Matron had lately taken an insisting that the girls should speak up, which from her meant raise your voice. It really was a very awkward situation. 
The climax came when the girls went out of their usual stroll up the valley to the tiny hamlet of Lauterbach. It was mid May by this time, and the first visitors for the summer were coming. The big hotels at Bracau were beginning to open, and soon the whole peninsula would be jostling with many people. This lasted for about four months, and during this time, the peasants of the valley made their yearly harvest. There was little doing in the autumn and winter, and what came now had to serve most of them for the rest of the year. Many visitors brought their children with them, and in this way the chalet school profited for it was easier for most of the parents to send their girls there for the morning lessons, so that they were safe. Besides this, a number of the Innsbruckers came up to the Tarnsees to spend the summer in their summer chalets, which were built round the lake, and the girls were day girls for the term. The Merciers were expecting their parents to come to the Crown Prince Carl for the summer, and several of the others would join their families sooner or later, coming to school every day. Only a few of them were boarders during the summer term. For this reason, Miss Bettany was always careful to impress on the girls the necessity for good behavior out of doors, and they generally were very good. Today, however, they shrieked and talked and laughed at the top of their voices, and as Mademoiselle disgustedly told them, made as much noise as the peasants at the carnival time. But it is not genteel, she, ex she expolated. You must not shout thus, but speak with gentle tones and softly. It is not well for you to make visitors think that that we of the chalet school are rude, rough, and noisy. They stopped at once. Their plan was never intended to harm their school. All the same, Mademoiselle was thankful when she had them safely behind the fence. She kept a sharp lookout on them for the rest of the day, and as they saw no reason for moderating their tones once they were away from public view, she heard enough to satisfy her that it was a general infection." Miss Bettany listened in dismay, silence to the reports that met her when she returned from Innsbruck the next day. I fear, Cherie, that it is Matron whom we must blame. Wound up, Mademoiselle, would it not be possible to send her away at half-term? Mad shook her head. Not unless we pay her salary in lieu of notice. Then I think we had better do so, said Mademoiselle with unexpected firmness. I would rather spend a few pounds and rid ourselves of her than keep her and let her spoil the whole school. Miss Bettany said nothing. She rather thought so herself. Mademoiselle had plenty to say on the subject, but what she was about to remark she never did. For at that moment Elisavita passed the study door and the two mistresses heard her say, at full pitch of healthy lungs, I'll go and bag the whole caboodle, Joey, old peach. Joey, shouting as if she were an irate right skipper on the quarter-deck, replied, All sereno, old fruit, carry on, and I'll follow. Miss Bettany looked petrified. How dreadful, she gasped. I must put a stop to this at once. Such language I will not allow. And as for the tones, I feel inclined to put them both in silence for the day. She stalked over to the door, opened it, and called the pair to her. They came looking as angelic as they could. Did you want us, madame? inquired Joey in a flute-like tone. Yes, said her sister. I wish to remind you that no gentlewoman ever shrieks her remarks for the whole world to hear. Also, that slang of most kinds is forbidden here. Most certainly vulgar slang of the kind I heard you using just now. Elisavita looked at her with limpid, pansy brown eyes. Is cadoodle slang? she asked. I thought it was all right. I have heard it here. Madge fell into the trap. You have heard it from one of the girls using such words, she asked incredulously. Oh, no, madame, Elisavita replied. It wasn't a girl. Miss Bettany then realized she had done, but she merely said, Then please do not use it again. You may both go on now. 
and you may write out for me what Shakespeare says is an excellent thing in women thirty times. Perhaps then you will realize the truth of this saying. They went off, not unnoticeably dampened by the punishment, and she shut the door behind them. You are right, mademoiselle, she said. Matron must go.'